All right, we've come to our last, but by no means our least, all the fish in the sea. Steve Cadron is with us, fisheries scientist. He's associate professor of fisheries oceanography at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth School for Marine Science and Technology. Uh, he's, he's in the business of saving seafood, an expert in general fisheries science, including resource management, issues of overfishing, studies uh, in collaboration with local fishermen, to determine how best to balance their livelihoods with protecting fish populations. We all know what a big, big issue this is around here. As president of the American Institute of Fishery Research Biologists, he's a former federal fisheries scientist as well, global leader in evaluating geographic stock structure and modeling spatially complex populations, much like yourselves. Uh, please join me in welcoming Steve Cadron. Steve. Thank you, Tom. I'm humbled by the brilliant ideas that were presented earlier today. Uh, but I'm honored to talk about sustainable fisheries because it's such a critical issue, as Tom said, in the New England region, uh, both economically and as part of our social and cultural heritage. Uh, I don't need to repeat my background, but so suffice to say I'm a population modeler. And when applied to fisheries, that's termed stock assessment. And stock assessment scientists answer the question, how many fish are in the ocean? And in the context of sustainability, it's more how many fish do we need there to be in the ocean, and how many fish should we be catching to meet all of our societal objectives? Um, I'll start off with my perspectives on this, is that um, early in the development of my science, uh, back at the turn of the 20th century, uh, scientists were really taking an oceanographic approach to fisheries. And from that emerged a convention to really focus on the stocks that our fishermen are targeting and study their demographics and their productivity. And we've had some successes in doing that. We've had many successes in reducing overfishing, ending overfishing, rebuilding depleted stocks. But we've also had many failures. And what we need to do is learn from those failures so that we can move forward and meet all of our societal objectives. Um, and really, uh, skipping to the chase, we really need to go back to taking oceanographic approaches um, to understanding the processes that we're not currently including in our science and management. So I'll go all the way back to the formation of our fishery science. And it started with Thomas Huxley. He was Darwin's bulldog, a preeminent scientist at the time. And he made the provocative statement that the great sea fisheries at that time were inexhaustible. And this did precipitate a, a very hot debate, uh, the formation of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And they really uh, debated this topic of overfishing. And after a few decades, really developed this convention on defining overfishing as removing more than the fish stock can produce. And when we consider that there are things like crowding that go on, we call density dependence, we realize that there's a happy medium at a, a moderate stock size at which fish stocks are most productive and at which we can take out our maximum sustainable yield. And maximum sustainable yield is the foundation of US fisheries management and global fisheries management. I'll give you a local example from scallops. Uh, in the mid-1990s, the scallop population was much less than the level we thought it needed to be at to produce this maximum sustainable yield. And so uh, there were legal mandates to uh, end overfishing, to rebuild this stock. And so there was action taken to reduce the amount of fishing, to change the fishing gears so that they were less destructive and more selective, and to close some important areas. And after a decade or so of that strict management, the scallop stocks rebounded to this rebuilding target that we had projected. We had extrapolated far beyond the obser ob observations we had about the fishery and the resource, but we attained that um, goal from, again, reductions in fishing. And now that we've done that, this is a highly lucrative and sustainable fishery. A report just came out today that New Bedford has maintained its status as our nation's number one fishing port in terms of economic yield. Um, and University of Massachusetts had a large part in uh, achieving that goal. And so we have a very simple models. In our very simple model, the biomass of fish out in the ocean is a function of how hard we fish them. If we don't fish them at all, 
We expect an unfished stock to be relatively high, and as we start fishing it, um, it will go down and down and down according to this model that was developed for scallops. And we look at the trajectory of scallops over the time of rebuilding. We see that it more or less conformed to this model. Um, this plot to me reminds me that all models are wrong, but some are very useful. And in terms of rebuilding the scallop fishery and resource, this model was useful. Uh, it wasn't the exact trajectory that the stock took on the road to recovery, but it was useful for managing the fishery to achieve many of our societal objectives. So now I'll go on to the more problematic New England groundfish. Um, again, starting about the same time I did with my scallop story, the mid-1990s. Uh, the principal groundfish stocks, cod, haddock, yellowtail, flounder, were all depleted. They were determined collapsed by scientists. And the same mandates that required rebuilding of scallops required rebuilding of groundfish. And so if we look at all 20 species of groundfish, these are the cods, haddocks, hakes, flounders, uh, we see that they were fairly depleted in the 90s, but after the same reductions in fishing, closed areas, um, modifying the fishing gears so that they're less destructive and more selective, we saw some rebuilding, and on first glance, this looks a lot like the scallop rebuilding. However, if we remove two of the success stories from that, redfish and haddock, we see that we really haven't achieved much rebuilding of the other 18 stocks of groundfish in our region. So it really leaves us asking why. So I'll return to that simple model that we had put forward for scallops and groundfish, where the amount of fish in the ocean is a function of how hard we fish them. What I've circled in red here is the domain of traditional fisheries um, pre-1990s in the United States and elsewhere in the world, where overfishing was happening fairly frequently. There was intense fishing. Stocks were at fairly low so stock size. And as I said in my introduction, I'm a modeler. And when a modeler is trying to represent a complex system, we start with the most important things, the most important factors. And in this domain, the most important things that are affecting fish populations is the fishery itself. And the models uh, in this domain work very well. These single species focused models work very well. But ironically, as we start achieving some successes using these models, we go to a different domain. We go to a domain of much less fishing. We've reduced the amount of fishing in New England by about 60% over the last decade or so. And we've rebuilt many of the fish populations. So now from a model building perspective, the fishery is no longer the most important factor in fish population dynamics. Now other species of fish that are rebuilt um, may have as much to do on the productivity of that fish stock than the fishery. So we reduce the fishing, we've built up other fish stocks, so the influence of other fishes and the environment become much more important. And in the context of things like climate change, the models that used to work, the models that got us to where we are, are no longer working. So we really need to revert back to what the early fishery scientists were doing, which is taking an ecosystem approach. And we can do this incrementally, and I'll show a few examples where we layer in things like climate, things like uh, predator-prey dynamics, uh, but that will really only get us so far. Because as we build more and more complexity into our models, our models collapse upon themselves because they are so complex. The usefulness of a model is it's an accurate simplification of a complex reality. And so many scientists are saying we need to make a leap into a more holistic ecosystem approach to fisheries. A couple examples of successful layering of the environment into our traditional models is uh, northern shrimp. So these pandalid shrimp are caught in the Gulf of Maine here. Um, I have a model where R, the recruits of small shrimp entering the population, is a function of S, the stock size, the mature fish, the mature shrimp in that population. So the recruits is a function of the spawners. But the second equation there has a different exponent term, where it adds in the effect of temperature. And we can see three different predictions here for warm, medium, and cold temperatures, where we get a very different relationship of the pro production of young shrimp 
from old shrimp. Again, layering in um, climate, and we know that climate's rapidly changing to improve our predictions of shrimp production and uh, potential to rebuild. We can also build in the dynamics between species. Um, this stock assessment of Atlantic menhaden builds in the consumption by fish predators like weak fish, striped bass, and bluefish. So not only are we monitoring the removals by the human population, we're monitoring the removals by the other fish populations as well to try to get uh, better predictions and better ability to rebuild the resources to maximum sustainable yield. We can take more holistic approaches, and in a terrestrial environments, we've been successful in doing this, um, but the marine environment is incredibly complex. It's vast, and it has connectivity to other systems. So we need to monitor, monitor many things. We need to define the boundaries. That's often difficult. But the third challenge I have here is confronting our trade-offs. As we start to achieve some of our conservation objectives, like ending overfishing, like rebuilding stocks, our societal decisions really become more important. And so layering in economics and social sciences into fisheries has really become one of the fruitful areas of what we're doing now, is confronting things like, should we be conserving all of the stocks? Should we be building them all at the same time? There are some critical trade-off decisions that need to be made to make this more holistic approach. We're extremely lucky in New England that we have some of the best innovators, some of the people with the most expertise in marine ecosystems, and that is the New England fishermen. New England fishermen have been scratching out an existence here for centuries. They know what other fish are eating. They know how temperature is affecting fish availability and production. And their local expertise can be partnered with scientific expertise to help achieve our objectives. And this is more than just feel-good talk. At the School of Marine Science and Technology at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, we've been applying this approach and have had some um, tangible successes. The first is in industry-based surveys, where we work with fishermen to survey the resource. Um, we take their expertise on fishing gear, on how fish are distributed in space and time, the effect of environmental factors, and we also apply our knowledge in statistical design, uh, technologies such as optics or acoustics, and, and then again, statistical analysis to use the data. So the recovery I showed of New England scallops was really buoyed by this greater information. This industry-based survey for scallops helped guide that recovery of scallops so that, it is, that New Bedford is now our number one economic port. We've done the same thing with groundfish, um, where we now can know the distribution and productivity of some of our flounder and cod species. We're also help, helping to confront some of the multi-species trade-offs. Bycatch is a problem in fisheries where fishermen are trying to target one marketable species, but they catch other species incidentally. And some of that bycatch may be of species that are still depleted, they're trying to recover, so what we're doing is working with fishermen to get fishermen to tell us the one thing that you never ask a fisherman, which is where did you fish? Where did you catch this? But because we've built this trust with fishermen, pairing our scientific expertise with their local expertise, they trust us to share their information. Fishermen will daily email their catches and their locations to us. Our graduate students are analyzing that data and sending out another email to the fleet out on Georgia's Bank and in the Mid-Atlantic and the Gulf of Maine on where their bycatch has a hot spot or where there is clean fishing. And we've seen that fishermen are changing their behavior, their fishing patterns, to go to cleaner areas of fishing and move away from these hot spots. And so this has been a great success in partnering science and fishermen's expertise. So finally, I'll leave you with a few thoughts, and that is the single species approaches that got us where we are, that have achieved so many things in fisheries, have reduced overfishing, rebuilt some stocks, actually have to be retooled. We have to build in environmental factors and biological interactions. Um, we need to go back to oceanographic approaches, 
And collaborating with fishermen is one of our best assets toward doing that. Thank you very much. Steve Cadron, thank you very much. That's just great. That is really interesting. On that, uh, on the northern shrimp, you showed us the chart. And here's, if, if we have cold seas, tons of shrimp. Yep. Uh, warmer, warmest, a whole lot less. Right. In current projections, which of those arcs are we on? Well, um, as you all know, we have a general warming trend going on. We noticed. And we're seeing profound changes in our marine ecosystem with that. We're seeing shifts of species that used to be in the mid-Atlantic are now up in the Gulf of Maine. There were many squid up in the Gulf of Maine this year. And they're having profound cascading effects. Squid are voracious predators. How are they affecting our cod? Many of our traditional New England fishery resources are subarctic, our cods and our flounders. And our New England habitats are really the southern extent of many of their ranges. And as we get warming, their productivity declines. So it's, it's a challenge to us. Do we uh, shift our baselines down, now to a new climate in New England? Or do we try to optimize for the current conditions or maybe rebuild to the productivity of the past? I mean, there was a time when I would think, even in your generation of fishery scientists, probably the idea was, we'll talk with the fishermen, and we'll work this out, and we'll fix it. Now it's floated up above, you know, in a way, above your pay grade, expertise, whatever you want to call it. I mean, does this induce a feeling of helplessness? Because you could talk with them about what they fish, but who are you going to go to talk to about global warming? Well, uh, you're really um, scratch, tipping an iceberg here that to truly get an ecosystem approach to fisheries, we need to think beyond fisheries. Yeah. We need to think about shipping and energy and contaminants and climate change. Um, that, and this is not only the holistic science that's needed, but the holistic governance and management. And uh, we do have an ocean plan out now that's trying to integrate some of these things, but we have a long way to go to do that. Do you feel that, you know, is there, like, in our government, in our, is somebody got all this in mind? Where's the Wizard of Oz? Um, there, as I said, this ocean policy is just starting up. It's a few years old. Uh, we started regionally with governance councils, but um, you know, we really haven't made some of those trade-off decisions I was talking about. If you compare energy, oil industry, and shipping, um, if it's going to be purely economics, those industries will be beat out fisheries. Yeah. Uh, even though fisheries has this cultural cachet and, and fabric of our New England community. Um, so it really will need some governance and trade-off decisions. Uh, scientific question, your gut feeling, are we screwed? N not at all. Not at all. I showed the example of New England scallops, um, and New England scallopers um, are relatively successful. Again, it's about a $600 million a year fishery. Uh, this can be done. Uh, I, I really don't ascribe to the doom and gloom um, headlines that you read a lot. Will I think our fishermen have to head north, north you know, to the Arctic? We need to adapt. I think that we need to be as adaptable as our New England fishermen are. That's pretty adaptable. Last question. When they're telling you where they're fishing and where they're catching, and not only where they're catching, but where it's clean and where it's got the bycatch hotspot, as you put it. Mm -hmm. that, that is a high level of trust. You it put is. that in a lockbox of some kind? I mean, do they, do they absolutely trust that you're not going to tell Joe where the fish are biting? Yeah, uh, we've consciously avoided entirely government funding with this. Uh, we have industry funding so that we can keep a lot of that information confidential, and that's very important to them. Wow. Um, look, we love seafood. And, and in, in these days, I think we're all made aware that I mean, we love everything that lives in the sea, because we, now we understand. We're all kind of in this together. So what you're doing is just incredibly important. I love the sophistication and nuance that you bring to it, and we wish you all the luck in the world. We need you Thank to you succeed. Very much. Thank you. Steve Cadron. Thank you very much. Great to have you here today.